Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to episode 132 of the BJJ Brick Podcast. My name is Byron. I'm here with my good buddy, Gary. How are you doing today, Byron? Oh, Gary, I'm doing great. We have a show with Joe D'Arcy, the uh, the man that the Darsh choke, choke was named after. So uh, very excited to bring that show and that interview with you guys. You know, it's incredible when you actually have a, a submission named after you. I mean, there's no Jabara submission or Hull submission. So um, uh, I think we're with somebody who's very legendary to have a, have a submission named after them. And then it'd be a submission that, is, that you'll... It's common in in like Very uh, common. submission grappling, jujitsu, and MMA. So I mean, he's he's watching pay per views and watching it on TV, and he's hearing his name. You know, be, get how cool would that out. be? <laughs> that would be incredible. And we talk about that a little bit during the interview. So uh, just just an exciting uh, and, and a fun guy to talk to. You know, and and uh, good time talking about jujitsu with Joe DRC. So, uh, so stay tuned. Do not miss that part of the show. If you don't want to miss the show, uh, a way that you can get this emailed to you with all the show notes in your email inbox would be to, to go to bjjbrick.com or on our Facebook page and put your email address and your name on there, and uh, we'll send the show out to you once a week. So uh, that's just a, a good way that we are able to stay in contact with you guys. So um, get your show notes delivered, hot and fresh. Hot and fresh, just like uh, donuts. So uh, that's that's how you like your donuts. That's how you like your BJJ Brick, <laughs> hot and fresh. Byron's the fresh one. I'm the hot one. <laughs> That's, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. <laughs> hey, and also uh, to keep your game hot and fresh, especially when you're first starting in your first year, check out Byron's audio book, Your First Year in BJJ. It's uh, two and a half hours of Byron guiding you through uh, uh, stuff you're going to encounter in your first year, make your first year a little bit easier, uh, help you learn more during your first year. Uh, it's only eleven dollars and ninety nine cents, and we have a link to it on the show notes. So definitely check it out. It's getting awesome reviews, and like I said, two and a half hours of content. Yep, we appreciate all the people who have uh, purchased the audiobook in the past. So uh, thank you very much, Gary. What do we have this week for the quote? Hey, uh, I know you all listened to last week's episode with Adam Wheeler. Uh, so this week we have uh, a double dose of Adam Wheeler as he's going to give us all a quote right now. And I've been saying this a lot is everybody knows that they have to do, you know, oh, I want to work out, but I have this to do. I have to do this to do. And, and so what I've been saying a lot lately is make time for it. For me, I get up, I beat the sun up. I'm awake before the sun comes up every day. And then I just get shit done. That's, that's all I've been saying to people uh, on like my Instagram and stuff to try to motivate them to get it done. So get up, do what you have to do. And, uh, Make the sacrifice to, to um, you know, make the sacrifice. It's not always going to be easy, but if you want to succeed, you have to get up and make make it happen yourself. Get up and get stuff done. Simple, to the point, and basically just do it. You know, when you wake up in the morning, realize what you're going to do that day, go out and do it. And uh, I'm actually probably the total opposite today. I've kind of uh, <laughs> taken a nap, which I never do. So uh, I am already, though, planning right after we get done with this episode, I'm going to go hit the Y, do a little cardio and some weight training. So I am going to get stuff done. But, you know, the, the, the quote is just simple, right to the point. Uh, do it. You know, yeah. don't talk about it. Get up and do it. Yeah, well, we we do a lot of our recording here, Gary, on a Sunday, so people may not realize we're not. This isn't a, a Monday uh, mid morning by now. We're, we're talking. We do a lot of Sunday recording just because we are busy people, and it seems to be a, a day that works out pretty well for us a lot of times. So getting up and, and getting to work, I think this is a good thing for me to think of because the days where I do that, I get up and I have like tasks that I want to accomplish or I have have a goal like right away. I get right on that, and then the the rest of the day. I'm just in like it seems like I'm in a higher gear of accomplishing things and getting stuff checked off the list versus if I kind of piddle around and I'm slow to eat breakfast and then I I might go to a jog but versus if I get up I'm gonna okay let's eat real quick I gotta get my run in then I'm gonna uh, you know go you know fix this in the house and go do this or go to work or whatever like the attitude of getting up and getting right to to doing important things I think that affects the rest of my day yeah it kind of puts you in a 
in a mood like you've accomplished stuff like you're you're slaying all the all the tasks put in front of you and uh, it just puts you in a little bit better mood you just uh know that anything that comes your way you're gonna do yep slaying those yep. tasks like dragons gary yep you know those dragons gotta be slayed <laughs> <laughs> uh very important Gary, I am loving my Fuji Sakai Gi. Uh, Fuji sent me a Gi to, to test out and to talk about, and uh, so far, so good. Uh, I got a review of it up on our uh, website here. Um, just look for, you know, Fuji Sakai Gi review, a uh, little video I've made. i uh, been testing it out exclusively. So it's been my only Gi that I've been wearing uh, probably almost for a month now. It's doing great. It's uh, lightweight, dries quick. It looks good. It's got... Um, a nice little globe pattern on the inside of it there. You can see it in the video. And uh, check out fujisports.com if you're interested in getting a Fuji Gi. Um, uh, I'm using mine a lot at home, but I also plan on using it when I travel. Yeah, he, when he's talking about he uses a lot at home, I have seen him wear it around the house. He cuts the yard <laughs> in it. And uh, I guarantee you nobody in, in Byers' neighborhood will mess with him. Well, people are messing with me in my neighborhood. Okay? That's part of the problem. But uh, hopefully the gi will help with that. I'm, I met this in my hometown, you know, like at, you know, while I'm home. But yeah, yep. Or say something like that to Gary. He's going to jump all over that. Well, it's normally uh, <laughs> little kids who are coming up to you and saying, "I want my two dollars." That's why I always keep two dollars in my pocket, man. You get yep. those kids off me. That'll work. It's easier just to pay it, buddy. Hey, this week we have an awesome article from our friend, as always. Uh, we, I know we've used numerous articles from her, but Valerie Worthington. Um, so I know you've heard us talk about her, and uh, she's been on the show, right, Byron? Absolutely. Yep, so I uh, need to check out that episode. But as usual, it's from BreakingMuscle.com, and we'll put a link to it on the show notes. But uh, I think everybody has ran into this, um, uh, what she talks about. Uh, the, the article is called Foot Beats Face, Mad Awareness and Safety in BJJ. And um, what she's basically talking about, she starts out with a story. She was training years ago with her instructor in, in uh, jiu-jitsu, and the mat was really crowded. A pair of uh, grapplers rolled into into them, and the, uh, the instructor stopped their training and asked them to move. Repeatedly, they continued to train right on top of us, and as she says, Tasmanian devil style. So you need to slay that Tasmanian devil. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, then she talks about the accident that happened. Uh, she was in her, uh, she was on her back, and, my, and her instructor was in her close guard. And uh, that same group, uh, one went to sweep, and the other attempted to defend the sweep, and basically stepped, landed heel right between Valerie's eyes. And uh, I guess there was a loud crunch. Uh, everybody just stopped and wondered what happened. And Valerie said she was probably concussed, but uh, back in those days, she just kept going. But, um, you know, she just, uh, somebody whose mad awareness was not very good and ended up uh, getting her right between the eyes. Yeah, and this happens in Jiu-Jitsu. So, so I trained at a couple of different places, mostly at Fox Fitness, and there the mats are usually packed. But a lot of times when I'm training with Gary, uh, the mat space is, is in a gymnasium, and it's huge. And so these are two things that are a lot different. So uh, training in the gymnasium style mats, we tr- start from standing a lot of times. You have, you know, a huge 20 by 20 area to work with, and you're really never near another person, you know, another set of people, I guess, you know, that much. Versus um, at, at the Fox Fitness gym, it, it does get a little crowded. You know, it will fit uh, three times as many people on, on the mat. So a lot of times... There'll be an area for people to do their takedowns, but that's kind of like they're taking up the room of like five people that could be gra- or six people. It's gonna be even numbers, I would guess, Gary, to grapple. But six people can grapple over there, or just those two people could do takedowns. Unless you're doing prison rules style, <laughs> where it's uh, two I knew you would say something about one. that. Uh, prison rules, I like it. So it's just a different uh, feel of grappling, and and you need to have that awareness of what's happening around you at all the time but at one point in time at, at the more crowded gym it's it's like a, a big part of it sometimes you might be up against the wall I'm not going to sweep them towards the wall because I can't you might be up against like the edge of the mat I can't take can't sweep them that way you know I don't want to roll off the mat or roll it next to you know on somebody else and uh, just being aware of how close people are and, and also I like to be aware of if they know that we're that close you know what I mean? Yeah, because like I think sometimes people don't – sometimes I see people don't realize that. You may be caught in a weird position. You don't realize that 
person you are that close to another set but that's where even if one person may see it and one person may not so um just that person who understands or, or feels you know a presence of another group can't stop it right then and there and uh I've, I've had some funny stories where i get towards the edge of the mat and i'm getting ready to stop it so uh, so i slow down real quick and think my partner knows and next thing you know uh he takes my <laughs> my softness that I'm getting ready to move as uh, I made a mistake and my arm gets caught in an arm bar. I've had that happen to me before. So that's never fun either. That's one of my best moves. It's called the edge of the mat grappling, Gary. And I really turn it yeah. up right when the guy kind of hesitates and is like considering moving. You see him looking around. That's your chance. Yeah. Uh, edge of the yeah. mat there. Well, have you ever used like the edge of the mat, the the border, you know, like an inch, inch and a half, two inches? Uh, thick there i've had like underhooks on people where i'm mounted and i'm trying to <laughs> trying to get their arm up over their head and and i'll put my fingers on that edge that you know inch inch and a half two inches and, and use that as like a, a lever to uh to crank their arm up so i've cheated a little bit myself too yeah it, it's all this we're talking about basically being aware of where you are on the mat and and, and dealing with that and it's a huge safety concern you know, very it, huge. You know, is your partner's head off the mat onto the the hard floor or not? You know, or if they give like a good oompa or, or try to shrimp out, are they going to be off the mat? So maybe it's time to turn their head around and put your feet towards that edge if it's that crowded to where you can't really get away from the edge. There's there's a couple of different things you could do, but it's just awareness of things. And then, uh, you know. Occasionally at work, we'll have a, a medical patient who is just going crazy. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's their blood sugar is out of whack, and they're really not able to control themselves. And I find myself, like, pinning somebody down in the living room, on a couch, on a bed, you know, different any, – any place in the house, it's all different. You know, a couch – you know, the, the bottom of a couch could be a great place to kind of pin somebody – you know, they're not really moving that so much. On the couch, well, we could fall from the couch, and that's not going to be fun. And then look around at the coffee table. is going to be like WWE style. Yeah. Well, you don't want to pin them on the couch because you might break the TV tuner. <laughs> and you know how important that is. That's true. So th- th- there's just a lot to consider. And I think that developing good mat awareness has helped me uh, when I'm at work dealing with somebody who's a medical patient like this. Kind of just take take the time and look around a little bit and see what's happening, what the other people are doing. I mean, that could be a safety concern for, for me. You know, is that person going to whack me over the head with a frying pan? Well, I'm trying to help this guy. I'm not trying to fight him here, but it may not look like that at the moment, you know. So that, those are things to consider. So being able to, to pause while you're grappling and look around is a good thing to be able to do. Not just to be so focused on the person you're trying to choke, you know, and, yeah. and, and get position on. And like we talk all the time, the way to become better, to be your best at jiu-jitsu, is to spend time on the mat. And if we look out for each other as training partners, there's going to be less injuries, which means you're going to spend more time on the mat and you're going to get better quicker. So uh, it, it it helps you both. It's going to help. It's going to ha- decrease injuries, which is, a, which is a big key if we want to keep training. Yeah, so it, it, there's a, I guess there's a few different types of injuries that just do. You know, if Gary and I are rolling and uh, catch Gary in an armbar and his elbow's sore, or he needs actually, you know, that's from the technique. And then there's like accidents. So if Gary and I are rolling and let's say, uh, I don't know, Mike and Miles are next to us and they happen to roll and fall on top of us and, you know, Gary twists his knee in that situation, that's that's a different type of an, of an accident versus like training too hard or, or me going too hard. It's just like, that that happened it's not good but you guys fell on us you know what i mean yeah so it's, it's it's involving more people it's not a technique it's more of a situation uh, situational awareness as well so um just be careful where you're at you hate to hurt somebody just because you fall on them or some accident like that yep yeah. i remember back in the day watching one of the early uh, ufcs uh it may have been ufc one i'm not sure or Oh, not UFC, Ultimate Fighter. It may have been the first season. I'm not exactly sure, but Nate Quarry was in it. Um, and I just remember uh, they were training, and Nate was maybe on the ground or stand. I can't remember where he was at, but another group, somebody uh, somebody during a scramble stepped on his foot or when he was training with somebody else and ended up breaking his ankle or twisting it really bad that he basically couldn't, couldn't continue. I mean, uh, here's a guy who... Uh, didn't have a chance to finish and win that show just due to a due to a freak injury like that. Yeah, not because he didn't tap, not because he got even caught in anything, just because he was grappling somebody else and somebody else did that, you know, an accident. Yep. So, 
So definitely uh, make sure you're you're aware of where you're at, where your opponent's at, and where where uh, uh, your other tr- where your other teammates are at on the mat, and uh, and we'll all be safe. Yeah, and it's a skill that that can be developed. That's what the, the article gets into. Like this is something that you could you could become more aware of because when you're brand new, you're not aware of any of that. You know, you're getting. Uh, put in these weird positions. You're get, you're uncomfortable. You might be getting choked a lot. It like it's hard to focus on what the guys next to you are doing, it, or or you know, are you near the edge or the wall or whatever? Oh, that's a blur. It doesn't matter to you. As you develop your just a skill a bit and can calm down, take take some time and look around a little bit. Kind of take things in. You know, I think this is real common when somebody comes and visits. People will kind of just watch and see how you know, oh he's wrong with that person. Let's see what's happening. That happens quite a bit. But uh, but from the safety point of view. You have to kind of keep it on everybody. Yep. And then another reason I think it happens sometimes too is when you first start, a lot of times your your ego is a little bit higher. You know, you want to tap people out. And you may be in a good position, but the guy's head's getting ready to go off the mat when in all reality, once you're in that spot, you should stop it. But sometimes people are a little overzealous for those submissions and want to get it and want to finish it. So, hey, who cares if he's off the mat or his, or his head is underneath somebody else's leg in the next group? Let's finish it real quick. So, uh, you know, drop that ego and uh, and let's start back up again. It's just going to make you better. You're, you're now going to have to uh, get back into that position. So you're going to have to fight for it. Realize that's going to make you better. Yeah. And another thing that, like, kind of the resetting in a safer area, uh, obviously somebody has a position on something, you know. So the way I typically handle this, if I let them decide whether we keep this position or we start again from a neutral way. position. But most keep the position. I think that's just kind of the standard. If if I have side control on you, we're going to move three feet this way. I'm going to keep sexual. Occasionally, the person will will go over to the area and they'll just be looking at me like, "Okay, let's go," and they're not laid on their back ready for me to get side control. So, not who cares? It doesn't matter. We're just we're training. We're not, you know, I don't have to have my hands in the correct position and have this super grip that I did. We're training. We're getting better as we practice our jujitsu in a safe way. So, uh, if I'm the higher mind. belt, I'll always make sure that I start. You know, I'll make my own position up. No matter if we weren't in there, I always start out with a fully extended knee bar, and uh, we'll go from there. <laughs> that's just one of the tricks of the trade. You know, that's why you got to train with guys like Gary to learn stuff like that. Yep. And then after I finish it, I, I put a little notch on my gi. That's important. <laughs> there you go. That's why your gi's all wore out, Gary. So many notches on there. So, uh, great article. It's on uh, breakingmuscle dot com. It's written by our friend Valerie Worthington. She was on episode one hundred and twenty three. That's one two three. If you want to listen to her interview, but uh, check out the article for sure. Um, basically, she got smashed in the face by somebody's foot. You know, for some accident that probably could have been prevented. Um, you know, but these will happen from time to time to people. I mean, it's just part of part of rolling in the gym with more than two people. But uh, but great article. Give it a read, my friends. So definitely check it out. Thanks, Valerie. All right. I think it's time to air our interview with Joe D'Arcy. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. He is so good at getting hooks in that he won the 2012 Bassmaster Classic without using a rod or a reel. He watches his belt, yet somehow it retains all the knowledge he has gained. He attended a woman's only seminar, and his only disguise was his charm. It took two hours for someone to notice his beard. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Joe D'Arcy to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. Uh, you, you've been a black belt for basically as long as I've been training, and uh, you've got a ton of knowledge. You've got a choke named after you, and you've got a rich history of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, uh, why don't we just start with a little bit about like your personal history, kind of where you came from, and, and what got you started with Jiu-Jitsu? Well, I started in martial arts uh, as a child. Um, my older brother and my, my father were in, in uh, Taekwondo. My dad actually... I uh, run the Taekwondo school, so that's something um, that I kind of grew up with. And I was kind of in and out of it, you know. Like sometimes I would lose interest, I would stop training Taekwondo. And uh, one day, um, two people who were basically wh- uh, white belts under Henzo 
came into my father's martial arts school and, you know, asked to just, you know, if they could rent mat time because, you know, traveling from, you know, Long Island to Manhattan was kind of costly. So if they can just get any extra mat time, you know, just to rent space for the master to train on their own, that's something they were interested in. So um, they came to my school, my, my father's martial arts school a couple of times. And I would say both of them were probably around like maybe 130 pounds. And as a teenager in, in ninth to 10th grade, I was pre- pretty much a big kid. I was like 150 pounds. So, you know, I rolled around the mats with them and they pretty much tossed me around like a rag doll. So I said, listen, I really got to learn some of this stuff. So they pointed me in the right direction. They pointed me to, to Hensel's Academy in Manhattan. So you started at Hensel's there when you were a kid? Um, I started or, um, when I was 16 and then I took a little bit of a break because I was – uh, playing basketball for my high school. So I started 16, and with basketball season, I took a break. And I, I would say I started um, hardcore when I was, like, 17, training consistently. Okay. That's common, I think, for for kids to try to just experience things. You know, you, you do some, some grappling, some basketball, baseball, whatever. You, you get into different things. That's what, that's kind of a, what, what kids do to figure out in the, what they want to do in the world. And it sounds yeah, like you're sure. kind of in that mode. What was what was Henzo's like back then? Well, you know, back then there, there there was not a lot of higher belts. So I mean, I mean, I started in '97. So you know, that's when I first started. I started training consistently in '98, but I started in '97. And I mean, if you saw a blue belt on the mat, that was considered a higher belt. You know, there was not many higher belts. It was it was a pretty um, young sport at the time. So I mean, it was only pretty much white and blue belts. You know, so if you've seen a blue belt on the mat, you know, that was something that uh, you would say you'd want to train with the blue belt. Like rather now, it's so popular. There's there's a lot of black belts out there, brown belts, higher belts on the mat. I mean, back then, if you got to train with a blue belt, you would consider yourself lucky. Do you think now people are getting better quicker at jiu-jitsu because they're having uh, better training partners, like more more black belts on the mat, more blue belts on the mat? I think um, I just think there's there's more knowledge and it's just out there. So people are definitely getting better faster for sure. Um, you know the, the knowledge is out there. Whether they whether the internet competitions, you know, like you said, there's just so many more higher belts out there that I mean, if you're really into it, like I was as a young kid, I was so passionate about it. If you're really seeking out that knowledge, it's just. It's just out there. It's, it's easier to find now rather than in 1997. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to remember, but back then, uh, in 1997, there's no YouTube, you know? There's no... Uh, a lot of the yeah. resources we take for granted we just weren't there. No, you're absolutely right. There, there was none of that. I mean, I don't know what year it was. I'm going to say maybe like 2002 or 2001 when I personally started, you know, looking at the internet and realizing, wow, there's a there's a whole other coach doing jiu-jitsu, you know? Like, and I was watching some competitions with some of the guys on the West Coast competing, and, you know, but yeah, like you said, 97, there's, there's no YouTube. There was, there was nothing like that where you could just, you know, type in a YouTube search, a uh, guillotine choke or triangle escape, and, you know, hundreds of, of techniques pop up. There was none of that. So w- when did you start competing? I would say it started in 1999, and... um you know, as a blue belt, I was competing in 99, and then I got a little bit more serious about it, 2000, 2001. And and you competed from there all the way up to black belt? Yeah, I was I was pretty active. Um, I was pretty active com- com- in competing. Um, you know, that's pretty much my focus. I would go to college, and, you know, while I'm in college, I was thinking about jiu-jitsu moves, you know, arm locks and things like that, so... I was uh, I was really into it, trained all the time, and I mean, if I wasn't at Henzo's Academy, I was, you know, training in in somebody's house or in my house with with some mats with some buddies, and I was training pretty much every day. I think that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, when I went through the ranks, I was just I was so active in the in the competition field that I think that really helped me to improve quick. The, the, competing more uh, increased the speed at which you actually got better. 
I would say so because you learn from your mistakes. Whether I lost or if I won, you're always learning. You know, I mean, obviously I didn't win all my matches. I I won a decent amount of them, out of them but you know, I'd watch the, the film of the of the you know matches that I might have lost, and whether it was by a takedown or, or points, and you know, I'd always try to get better because no one likes to lose. So I would make sure that that specific um, situation didn't cause a, a loss the next time. So I was always studying my own film and uh, things like that. Yeah, that, that's one thing that doesn't really happen much uh, in the in the gym. You know, we I lose all the time in the gym. I get tapped, and I, I don't really worry about it. I just it's just part of training. But if you know you compete, you kind of think about okay, what happened, you know, and you break it down. And you try to learn from it a little bit more than you would just from getting tapped in a normal situation during training. <laughs> everyone get, everyone gets tapped in the gym, and if you and the thing is, if you're not getting you know, pushed or you're getting, whether it's tapped or if you're not getting passed or swept in the gym, then, you know, I, I don't know where you're training. I mean, you should, that's that's the, I consider training in the gym pretty much the lab. That's where you want to try your moves, moves that maybe you're not that proficient at. You know, you want that's where you want to try them because it's a controlled setting. I mean, that's where you're supposed to get better, you know. But in the same respect, if you're training for a tournament, you know, uh, uh, you know, when you're focusing for a tournament, you got to have that, that mental mindset that, you know, if I'm training and I'm going to compete next month and I'm on the mat, people, I'm not going to let them pass my guard. That, that's my mentality. I can't. I can't give up those points. So if you're training during, you know, the off season in the sense that you're not training for a competition, yeah, that's the time where you play, you have fun, you know, maybe you give people your back, you let people get side month on you, you know, say, hey, if they tap you, hey, no problem. You regroup, start over, and that was fun, we'll give it a shot. But, you know, it, it, it depends what you're doing. You know, I remember when I was training competitively, you know, you always have to have that mindset for the points, whether if it was like a sport jiu-jitsu match or a submission grappling match. You know, there's you follow what I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It uh, you need to have a, a different mindset. I'm curious. Um, so, what was your what was your game like during your competition years? Like, what kind of a game plan did you come in with? That's 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 funny you ask. I, I was out to to lunch with one of my students, and they, they were asking me that when I used to compete. You know, what was or something I like to do. I prefer to be on top passing, but um, in, in, in the gym and the training, I always work my guard so I can get on top. So I, what was important to me was to know that if I got on bottom, that I would be able to reverse the position and get on top enough to pass. So, I mean, just like most other guys, especially from Henzo's, I mean, we were known for, you know, passing the guard very tight, you know, not giving much space and, you know, controlling the person on the bottom. I think the whole academy was known for that when I was competing. So, I mean, just like everyone else I trained with, I, I would prefer to be on top, look to pass, and look to finish on the top. And, and as you're developing this this top game of, of passing with a lot of pressure and tightness, um, I, I think we all kind of experiment with things in jiu-jitsu, you know, at different times in our in our development. Uh, some things, sometimes you you find things, you you take it a little, little bit from over here and a little bit from over there and you, you kind of add it to your game. Um, did you have anything that you really found to be uh, a good good top game uh, technique for you that, that you really worked on and then developed? Well, you know, I remember, um, I, I, like like you said, I always like to pass tight, low, uh, control my opponent. But like, like everyone else, I would watch videos. I would watch videos of what's what's working, what's being successful for people, you know? And I remember as a purple belt... Um, just watching some of the some of the black belts that were fighting and some of the things they were doing and they were having success with, and um, just trying to mimic it, M- mimic the, mimic some of the stuff they're doing in the tournaments and just messing around with it and training and, and see if it applied to my game. Cool, and, that's, and, and that, there's that's one the, black belt in particular. Yeah. There's one black belt in particular, um, um, uh, Margarita. Well, when he was competing, he was uh, you know very successful with a lot of different passes, and that's someone that. You know, as a purple, when I was watching, I tried to mimic some of the things that he did. And, um, you know, some were successful and, uh, you know, maybe some weren't. But, again, it's just about trying to expand your game, seeing seeing new techniques out there and just trying to, to, to get better, expand the things you do and be open-minded to, you know, numerous types of techniques. You know, you you don't want to stick to just with a handful of moves that you're good at. You know, it's you have to play around with other things because, you know, I could go against somebody – where maybe my, my low-type passing will work, and then guess what? 
maybe it won't. Maybe I have to stand up. Maybe I have to do more of a bull type, a bullfighter type pass to to pass this this specific guard. So it's important to to be well rounded in that sense, you know. Because I know that I'm sure you know that too. You know, you train with some people. You know, maybe maybe it's a little bit easier to pass their guard a certain way, but you really don't want to, you know, engage too much because maybe they have a really good spider guard or they have a really good half guard. So maybe I want to make space and you know try to step around and bullfight. Yeah, it, it it sounds like you're kind of advising that uh, to have a when you, when you go compete, it's okay to have a, a game plan with a couple of, of of really good techniques. But when you go to the gym, you you said it's like your lab. It's just time to experiment with things and try to open it up and and then and then when you go back to compete, you want to get everything tightened up again and and, and try to try to impose your will and, and to do your things. Definitely. Well, uh, okay, your your name, Joe, uh, is pronounced. DRC, and there's a choke that is Correct. a very similar uh, pronunciation. Uh, people call it the Darce choke. Yeah. Uh, w- w- what do you have in common with the Darce choke? And tell me a little bit about this history. Well, it's pretty funny because, you know, when it became popular, you know, everyone's quick to say, oh, he didn't invent the choke or this and that. And you know what? They're absolutely right. I didn't invent the choke. I never claimed to invent the choke. Um, I was actually shown the choke by uh, one of Henzo's black belts, uh, John Danaher. He showed me the choke. I uh, I really liked it. I found that, you know, I was in this position a lot to do the move. So I just started drilling it, got pretty proficient at it. And, um, you know, anyone who trained with me knew that uh, it was one of my go-to moves. And at that point, it was really not named anything. You know, no one really called it anything. I mean, I guess some people called it maybe a reverse Bravo choke, which is which is fine. Um, and I would say, if I could think of the year, maybe it was maybe 2004, um, approximately 2004. I would say um, uh, Jason Miller came to Long Island to train. Um, I think he had a fight coming up in Hawaii. I forget who was fighting. It might have been um, uh, one of the Annoys. I think he was fighting Egan Annoy. So he came to Long Island to train, and he stopped in uh, Belmore Kickboxing Academy. Uh, Belmore currently has a lot of guys fighting uh, in the UFC. Um, so we were training there. After a training session, you know, he was very curious. He's like, hey, man, you know, what was that choke? You know, because it came up in training. So I showed it to him. He loved it. You know, it's, it's very common. You train with someone you haven't trained before. You, you you do a round. You train a little bit. Any moves that come up during a training session, hey, what was that? You know, because everyone's always looking to improve and get better. So that's pretty much what happened. And um, at that time, he was training with Mark Lehman. He brought the, the choke to the West Coast, um, to Vegas, with Mark Lehman's gym. And at that time, Mark Lehman was training a lot of fighters. So... Layman loved it. He called it the Darce choke, and um, that's pretty much how it happened. You know, he was training a lot of fighters at the time. It just became known as the Darce choke. They they made it pretty much popular on the West Coast. They're aware how to spell my last name and how to pronounce <laughs> it. But, you know, when I when I asked Mark about it, he just said, "Hey, man, you know, Darce is way easier than DRC. You know, it's one syllable. So I'm coaching my guys. I just say Darsum." <laughs> that's pretty funny I, I get a chuckle out of it I always get a chuckle out of it when I hear it whether it's on the UFC or you know any other mixed martial arts organization they refer to it as the dark stroke it's, it's flattering for sure it's flattering but it's also I also get a chuckle because you know again I never claimed to invent it I never claimed to, you know told anyone to name the choke after me or anything it's just it just happened that way yeah and then the name is stuck and it's going to be uh, the Dars choke uh, forever. I mean, that's it, it now has. When you that's learned it, it there I wasn't mean, a name. Correct. I mean, hey, if you if you came to my gym and you know I never trained with you before, and you showed me a cool sweep and you swept me with it, and I taught it to my guys, I'm gonna say, hey, man, this is the Byron sweep, and that's pretty much how it happened, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't I don't have anything cool like that to, to show anybody. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it, it's a it's a fun story and just the. So, I, so the people at your gym, how do they pronounce it when they when they're doing it? Just Dars. Um, you know, they jump on the bandwagon of, okay. of the popularity. They call it the Dars stroke, but it's how, pretty funny because when I when I teach the move, I don't even call it that. I just like if I'm showing the move, 
I don't really have a name for it. And then they're like, oh, is that the Dosh Choke? And I'm like, ah, yeah, I guess, yeah. So I don't say, hey, guys, let's review the Dosh Choke. I don't, I don't say that. I say, all right, you know, let's, let's take a look at this position. You know, I just refer to it as a regular choke. Cool. Yeah, I think that's – people want names for things a lot of times, but uh, it seems like back – a while back, there wasn't names for every technique we did or every sweep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 100%. Exactly. And, you know, I think that to, to an extent, it might be easier to learn if everything was named something, kind of like a letter in the alphabet, like A, B, you know, A, B, C, D. Like if every choke or every technique had a name, it, it, it would be that much easier to yeah. to teach because everyone can always refer it to something, you know. Yeah, and, and some techniques, from what I've seen, uh, have different names as different gyms and organizations use different names. Uh, it's yeah, in that culture, sure. but doesn't translate or, you know, uh, go over all of the the ones. But, like, the Dars surely yeah, has. Yeah, so it's just <laughs> No, the, the, I mean, the term Dars is, is what people use in all the all the different academies and schools around the, yeah. around the world. I've seen, I've seen people refer to it as, like, a reverse anaconda and a reverse bravo as well. And I guess it's the same. You know, it can be considered the same. Hey, and guess what? If they refer to it as the reverse Bobo, the reverse Anaconda, that's fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Again, I never I never said, hey, this is my choke name after me. That, that's not that's not what happened at all. Yeah. It sounds like you're just a guy who, who found a choke that worked well for you, and you got really good at it, and somebody came in from out of town, and they were impressed by that, and they took it back to where they were from, and and then uh, it was Bingo. out of your hands. <laughs> Bingo. I remember I remember having discussions with uh, John Danehara, you know, uh, about it. And he kind of uh, chuckled himself. He he giggled. And I, I wanted to let him know. I'm like, hey, John, you know I never claimed to invent this, you know. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> asked me about it. I let him know. You showed me this move. And he just, he, 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 he thinks it's funny as well. He just kind of chuckles. And he knows. He knows the type of person I am. He knows I'm not. You know, out there saying, "Hey, this is my choke, everyone." You know, call the door choke. I made it up. That's that's really not what happened. Like you said, it's just I was pretty proficient at it. I was doing it from a lot of different um, setups, and you know, trained with someone from out of town. They ran with it, showed showed their uh, buddies in the West Coast, and then that's pretty much how it became popular on the West Coast. Cool. That's that's a fun story. Uh, while I've got you here, and 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 you're. Joe DRC, I got I want some uh, some Dars tips from you. I guess if if you're going to teach the technique to uh, uh, somebody who's fairly new at jiu-jitsu, maybe six months or a year, uh, mm-hmm. like what position do you teach this technique from? I think the easiest position to teach it from is the is the turtle. You know, rather than um, you know when someone's turtled, you can always make a back latch and take the back and get the hooks in, but pretty much from that position. You know, if someone's in the turtle and I'm on top, um, you know, you go right into that position where you get that gable type grip where, you know, you, you, you fish your, your arm inside, you get your shoulder on the person's, um, chest area, make that palm to palm grip behind the head, drive them up. Once they're on their side, just grab your bicep, just like you would for like a, a rear naked choke, put that hand on the person's shoulder and squeeze. Um, one tip I would say is, I, I see a lot of people, they jump ship too early on their palm-to-palm gable-type grip, and then the person on bottom, you know, they'll straighten their back or they'll manage to escape. You know, I see that often. When you when you make that gable grip and you really drive your partner on their side, you have to make sure their head is close to you before you jump ship on the palm-to-palm gable grip and reach for your bicep. I, I see that all the time, even in my gym. And I, t- I let them know, hey, you, you can't, jump ship on the gable grip too soon. You have to really make make sure you're controlling, um, you know, your partner's head there with that palm-to-palm type grip. Once you have that head close to your body, that's when you can, you know, fish that arm in and grab your bicep, and then you can just squeeze and look for the tap. It sounds like you're really stressing that it's not a, a speed thing. Is You're having control over the person. 100%, you know, because if you rush it, you're going to lose it. And again, it's something I see all the time, whether it's you know, just watching videos and competitions or, or fights or, you know, most of the time just in the gym I see people. You know, they try to do it. They just, they look to rush and get the finish. And I don't have long arms. Maybe some people can't, you know, but, you know, I was I was forced to really, you know, get that control. You know, keep that palm to palm grip, pull the person close to you and look to finish. Maybe people with longer arms can skip a, a step, you know, right to the, grabbing the bicep and finishing but you know I, I couldn't do that i had to take it step by step now, now uh if somebody is wanting to is thinking about learning the, uh, this choke do they 
I, I, there's a lot of different things I could learn right now based on my body type and, and, and the, the tools I naturally mm-hmm. have. Would you recommend that somebody with shorter arms or longer arms is easier or harder one way or the other? Um, you know, I don't, I, 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 obviously people with longer arms, maybe they have an advantage, but people with normal to shorter arms, I think they can still do the move again. It's just, you can't rush it. You have to go step by step. You know, you have to, you know, control the person, your partner on bottom with that palm to palm grip when they're on their side. Okay. And then once you get that control, that's when you go to the finishing hold. I think um, that's the most important part because I've trained people who they say, hey, I don't really have long arms. I can't do this move. But they're trying to jump right to the finishing hold where they're, you know, grabbing their bicep and squeezing and, you know, they're totally skipping the step of controlling your partner with the palm to palm gable grip. You know, if you really pull your partner's head close to you, okay, and you squeeze squeeze that head close to you, shoot in for the finishing hole, that's when you're going to be successful with the choke. But to answer your question, people with long arms, they probably have a, a, a little bit more of an advantage, but people with normal to shorter arms can still do the move if they just use the proper technique for sure. So you recommend the the turtle, top turtle, as a good position to, to learn this. But uh, you, I've seen the darts in many different positions. Um, is that Correct. is that one of the stronger positions to start it from, or is that just a great position to learn the technique from and, and branch off? I think I think it's important. I think it's important just to to get comfortable uh, learning it pretty much from there. You know, I, and then once you're used to finishing the move, I mean, you can do it from half guard. You can do it. Um, from knee on belly, you know, from side mount, you know, there, there's a lot of different variations and setups you can get into it. But, you know, I, I think you have to feel comfortable with finishing the technique, you know, with, with grabbing uh, that palm to palm grip, keeping your partner closer, and then work it up and finishing the choke. You have to get comfortable executing it in one position before you can play around with it in numerous other positions. Or else it's just going to turn into a, a sloppy attempted choke. Sometimes when I get caught in a dars, it feels like I'm getting just kind of just crushed, and sometimes it's like a really tight choke, and I'm going to get pass mm-hmm. out. Uh, what is the person doing differently to to provide the difference? I think the arm positioning. So if you feel like your head's getting crushed, they probably do not have your arm uh, appropriately across your your neck in the right position. You probably maybe have it across your face, or a little higher across your ear. Um, so that's important as well. You have to get. Uh, if I'm on top of you, I want your elbow pretty much right on my chest, okay? And then I'll I'll control curl, control you with my palm to palm grip, and I'll shoot in for the finish. But some people, you know, maybe the arms not in position, maybe maybe your arms across your face or more, more towards your forehead, and that's when it turns into a crank. So that arm position, because ultimately it is a head arm choke. So if the if the arm is not in position, then that's when it's going to turn into a crank. Yeah, and it, it, it's very painful, but it's not uh, not putting you to sleep uh, so much as, as when it's done properly. Yeah, and you know when I see that in my gym, I you know I, obviously I, I I correct it because you know what nobody wants just their face cranked or <laughs> or their neck cranked, you know, because you know even if someone's stubborn not tapping, they're going to have a a sore neck the yeah. next day. Rather than if it was just a straight choke, you know, they tap, you know, and guess what, they can do another round. So yeah. I definitely intervene when I see that, especially with newer people, because, you know, I don't want the guy on bottom going home with a sore neck, you know. He's a guy who just came to get a workout, learn some martial arts, you know, I don't need him going home, going to work the next day, and he can't turn his neck. That That's something that I would ask when I was first trying to pick this choke up. I, I'd get it, and they they if they tapped, I'd ask, was that um, was that a, was a good choke, or was I kind yeah. of just cranking on your neck there? And yeah. getting that feedback yeah. was, was good. No, that's good etiquette. That's good etiquette to do, too, because... You know, if they said, hey, no, you know, it was more my face, and you know for next time, oh, okay, maybe I'll adjust it a little bit, and maybe I'll be successful if I could just adjust that arm a little more. But, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It, it, it's uh, it, So I also want to know, if if I, if if I come into your school and you don't know me, um, I kind of want to get Darst. I mean, like, it, it's kind of a, uh, well, why not? You know, why not have a Joe D'Arcy uh, catch me this choke? Do you, <laughs> do, you, do you still do the technique very much? Um, I do. I do. It's, it, it's still a big part of my game, you know. Um, being that it's, it's, it's popular now, it's not really surprising anyone, you know. I mean, 
it's not in the move that I'm going to pull on someone. They're going to say, wow, I didn't see that coming because, you know, they know it's coming. Yeah. But again, I just, I just have to be better at executing. You know, I mean, they know it's coming. I have to be tighter with my position. I have to really control my partner before I, I, you know, try to apply the choke. But yeah, it's something I still do. Um, and it's, it's a big part of my game. So if you came to my gym, I can't guarantee you that I would dog <laughs> shit, but I would probably I would try. <laughs> well, good. That makes that makes me happy to know that you're still out there doing the doing the choke that uh, that it was named after you. That's cool. We all have different phases in our uh, martial arts development, and we experiment with different things. What belt level were you at when you started doing this choke? I started doing it when I was a purple belt. What is it? Um, what is it about purple belt that is like a a time where people experiment a lot with different with new things? I think purple belt is one of those belts where, and I've heard it from, you know, a lot of the people that I respect in the, in martial arts. Um, it's one of those belts where, you know, if you get a good purple belt who's been training a lot and has a lot of knowledge, I mean, they they, they can pretty much, you know, definitely know as much or be as good as even a black belt, you know, it's really one of those turning point belts, you know, I yeah. think it separates you from being a, a, you know, a beginner belt, a novice, you know, I figure white bull is still new novice. And once you hit that purple belt, you know, it's, it's a respected belt. You know, I, I mean, I've, I've trained with some tough purple belts and when I was purple belt, you know, I was out there in the competition scene, really, really doing my best to, to learn as much as I can. And, and train hard. So it's it's one of those belts where, you know, once you once you get a season the purple belt, I mean, it's not really that far away from black belt. Yeah, and and, and uh, it, I, I agree. If you if you if you're rolling with the purple belt and you're even if you're a black belt and you kind of get a, a little relaxed or give them too much, you, you get in a, a lot of trouble very quickly. It seems like from my experience anyway. Definitely. So uh, what are you doing now? Um. Well, I'm still running. I'm still running my uh, my school. Okay. Um, you know, doing the doing the family thing. Married, two kids, so you know, I separate my time with you know running my school, um, family life. Got two dogs. So Keep me busy. <laughs> you, your your priority has has changed a little bit. It sounds like from uh, competing back then to uh, maybe coaching or developing your students. Is that correct? Correct. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I competed for so long. Um, you know, honestly, just from competing while I did kind of get burnt out a little bit. And, um, you know, I really do enjoy just, just training beginners, you know, just, just seeing people walk in the gym and, you know, maybe they never trained martial arts before. Maybe they're, they're not that coordinated and just see what jujitsu can do for them. You know what I mean? It, it's amazing. You know, you get someone walk in the gym who, again, has no martial arts experience. And, you know, their, their first few months, I mean, you know, they have no balance. You could just push them over and they're going to fall. And then to see them, you know, two years from now develop that base, being hard to, you know, hard to sweep them, you know, and just their improvement. It, it's very rewarding. It really is. Yeah, I, I agree. And it, it's fun to, to watch that development of somebody. A lot of coaches gravitate towards the the naturally athletic people and the people who comes in and and they're they're very fit and maybe they wrestled for a few years. But uh, I agree, it's always fun to watch somebody who comes in with basically no ability to grapple at all and and mold them into a jujitsu practitioner. Yeah, and I I, I really um, enjoy when I get um, you know kids that come in in their teenage years because it reminds me of myself. You know, like. You know, training martial arts and jiu-jitsu really helped me stay focused and doing something constructive. You know, I wasn't out hanging out with friends, possibly getting in trouble. I was, I was in the gym training. You know, on the weekends I was, I was getting sleep and and making sure I was eating well so I could make weight the next day. You know, so I think it really kept me focused, kept me doing something constructive. You know, I finished college, so when I see uh, teenage kids come in the gym, I, I know jiu-jitsu can do that for them. So it's my hope that they'll continue their training, you know, even after high school and college, and you know they can have the same benefits I have. Do you have a like a kids class in at your school, or do you throw everybody together, or what's the age uh, break? For um, that? no, I, I have. Um, I do have a, a kids class. 
I have one of my purple belts that, that runs the kids' class. It's usually between 7 years old and 12 years old, um, depending. You know, if there's a, a bigger 12-year-old, we'll throw, we'll throw them in the adult class, but usually it's 7 to 12. And I do have some some early teenage years uh, kids in the, in the adult class as well. I would say like 13, 14, and, you know, they hold their own. They're doing well. Yeah, that, that that's cool to watch the, those kids come up and, and get better. If if one of your students is going to do their first tournament, uh, what advice would you have for them? Um, you know, something I do let them know is I don't really want them to compete too early. You know, sometimes that can be a little discouraging. If someone has been training for, you know, four months, they want to just jump in the tournament, maybe they train twice a week, they don't even train that much, I, I tell them not to rush into it. If something they want to do, there's always going to be another tournament. So first, I like to make sure that they're ready for a tournament, you know, because maybe that's how injuries happen as well. Maybe maybe they don't have as much knowledge as they need to compete yet, and, you know, they'll go out there and they'll overcompensate, you know, using strength rather than technique, and maybe they could possibly hurt themselves. So first, I make sure that me or one of my black belts feel like they're ready for the tournament. And um, next thing I tell them is, you know, just go out there, have fun, make sure you get your mat time in, in the gym, and um, obviously I'll help them train, whether it's myself or my black belts, and just to, to focus on some basic stuff. You know, I think people are too too quick to learn the, the, the next fancy sweep when, you know, maybe they need to have a strong concept of the basics before they can, you know, learn that, you know, advanced barambola sweep, you know? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more with you about about trying to focus on the basics and, and get ready for that. Um, why is it that people seem to gravitate towards the the adult black belt division to to try to learn all their techniques when they're when they're still fairly new at this game um i think because that's who they look up to you know i mean that's what that's what's advertised you know i mean you know you don't see the blue purple brown belt um you know absolute finals advertised as you would see like the black belt finals and all the weight classes so that's what they're showing. That's what they're seeing. And, you know, think about it. If I won a tournament in a black belt level from uh, an X choke combo to an arm lock, eh, not as flashy as a Baron Bola sweep to a back take to a choke. Again, it's a very effective uh, move to Baron Bola. I'm not discrediting it. For sure, it's very effective, and it's proven to be effective. But, I mean, anyone who's proficient at the Baron Bola, I'm sure they would even tell you that, you know, if they have an academy and they have students... You know, they're teaching them the butterfly sweep and the scissor sweep before they learn the barambola. You know, so I just think it's, you know, people view these techniques and they, they think it's cool and they want to jump in and do it, but they really should focus on the basics. If you've got a, a blue belt uh, wanting to compete, would is it better to watch uh, the blue belt, like, competition video or just to watch any competition video of the black belt? What's, what's healthier? I think, to be honest, I think watching anything is helpful because it gets you in that mindset of just jujitsu in general. So if they're watching blue, purple, brown, black, I don't really think it matters. You know, I just think it's, it's, it's beneficial to watch any level. You know, when I was coming up 19 years old, 20 years old competing, I, I watched all levels, you know, cause I, I, I was always willing to learn and, um, from anyone, any belt level. And I think that's the mentality you have to have. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I to this day I still learn from, you know, lower belts, meaning blue, purple belts. I they, maybe they're doing something, they're they're doing a grip or a setup here and there that that I find helpful, and then I'll I'll try to use it too. So I think it's important to always have that mentality that you can always learn. You're never too good to learn. I mean, there's so much techniques out there. There's nobody that knows everything. So I think it's important to be humble and just continue to be a student of the art and. You know, be willing to learn and want to learn. Yeah, th- there's always more techniques, but the, from my experience, there's, the, the techniques that I get good at, I learned that there's even more to them that I didn't understand, even though I was able to perform them okay. Uh, I learned that, that you know, the smaller details and, and little tiny uh, things about the move that make it more effective or that set it up better. Yeah, I think that's what's so amazing about the art, you know. Um, I, I, I'm in that boat as well. If I'm doing something pretty good at a move and I learn one little detail that can make it that much better, it's just like, 
the light bulb goes off in my head, you know, that ah moment, like, ah, that's that little detail I needed. And that's what I try to do to my students in the, in the gym. You know, if they're pretty good at the move, they're missing a detail here and there. And when I should make, make that little correction and I see that light bulb in their head go off, like, ah, that's the reason why I wasn't getting this choke or that's the reason why he was getting out. So for sure, the, the, the littlest detail can make such a, uh, an impact on the on the technique, sure. Yeah, uh, you mentioned a little bit ago that uh, you don't want your students to compete too early, and and that sometimes that there some students you know can only train twice a week, and uh, and they and they get all excited and they want to compete, but that's that's a reality. You know, people are busy and they and they have a limited amount of time they can get in and train. Um, so yeah. I, I'm sure you have plenty of students that can only come in twice a week. Um, what could they do to uh, ensure their progress, at, you know, at the best rate possible uh, when only showing up twice a week? Well, I think with twi- coming twice a week consistently, you will improve for sure. But, I mean, if someone's training three or four times a week, it's pr- pretty evident that they will possibly improve faster just because they, they have more mat time. But at my gym, I don't even offer a one-day-a-week membership. I tell people, listen, I really need to see you here twice a week because I want you to improve. You know, I, I think you have to minimally come twice a week. So I'm not saying that if someone comes twice a week, they're not going to improve. I just say maybe they, they won't improve at the rate as, say, someone who's training three to four times a week. But in the same respect, you know, if you're new to jiu-jitsu, it's, it can be tough on the body. So I don't even recommend really people coming every day when they first start. And if they do and they're persistent about it and they say, hey, listen, no, I, I really love this. I want to come every day. I make sure they're not having hard rolling sessions every day. So maybe on their off day, they'll, they'll learn the technique of the day. Maybe they'll do some drilling. Maybe, maybe they'll do some slow rolling, you know, where it's not, um, you know, 100% uh, pace roll. Maybe they're doing a, a 50% or 40% roll or rolling. So to answer your question, you know, people who train twice a week can improve for sure. But obviously if someone's training three to four days a week, they're they probably going to improve faster. Yeah, it, but it sounds like you also give a good uh, warning for people who are training as much as they possibly can that uh, you can experience getting burned out, you, your injuries probably go up, and, yeah. and, and that sort of thing, yeah. so you kind of watch no, out. Yeah, for sure. I think even taking a little break can be helpful. You know, some people with injuries, when they take a break and they come back, and they, they surprise themselves. Wow, I thought I was going to be rusty. Wow, I didn't realize, you know, I, I still have it. I'm not that tired, you know, so... I'm, I'm cautious that people in my gym don't get burnt out. If I see someone training really hard, um, you know, every day for X amount of time, you know, I'll question them. I'll say, hey, how are you feeling? How's your body feeling? You're feeling a little sore? And I'll warn them, hey, listen, I've been in your shoes. You know, take a little break here and there. Maybe if you're going to come tomorrow, maybe you should just drill. Or, you know, if they're a purple belt or a brown belt, maybe I'll say, hey, why don't you grab one of the, the blue belt tools a little bit newer and just let them work positions on you and you work escapes. You know, things like that, because I've, I know from experience, you know, when I was, when I was a teenager coming up in the game, you know, my body was so sore. I used to have tendonitis in my arms. You know, I used to wake up sometimes feeling like an old man and it's because I pushed myself too much. Yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, warning to, to heed, you know, don't, uh, it, we all want to push and get better and especially if the time is available to us and we're, you know, not really injured, but, uh. But yeah, listen to your I mean, body. Yeah, it's it frustrating for everyone. Everyone who, who gets into this art, um, it can be frustrating, you know, especially if they're really into it because they, they want to get good. They want to get it fast, you know. It, it, it takes time. I mean, I, I remember when I was, you know, traveling to Henzo's, you know, three, four days a week, and um, <clears throat> I think I was in high school at the time, and um, it was during the morning time because, you know, it was the summertime, no school. And I remember uh, talking to one of my instructors, Rodrigo Gracie, and I said, you know, I'm just so frustrated, you know, I'm, I don't feel like I'm improving, you know, because I was going against people who were more experienced than me, and I was just always on the receiving end, whether it's, you know, them smashing me on top or just sweeping and finishing me, and, and I would stick in there, and I would finish the rounds, and he just told me, he goes, man, listen, the, the bridge wasn't built in one day, and that's something I tell my students to this day, you know, because I remember him telling me that, and he's, he's absolutely right, you know, I was a young kid, and I was really into it, um, I was training all the time. I just I wanted to, to get good fast, but it, it takes time. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. So, 
when I see that student who's frustrated in the corner, you know, with his head down because he just had a bad rolling session, I said, hey, man, <laughs> you know, the, br- the bridge wasn't built in one day. You know, just stick with it. You're improving. Um, you know, it just takes a little time, but you- you're going to get there. You know, you're doing well, you know. Yeah, that's that's a I, I love that story. It it makes uh, everybody realize that that you were once that that person who felt like you weren't getting any better. You're frustrated, and, and your coach had to talk to you and say, "Hey, you know the bridge wasn't built in one day. You'll get better, and it's not you're not going to notice how much better you're going to get right away. But but keep at it, and you'll get better." That type of uh, message. And now you're you're giving the same thing to your students because uh, they're in a similar situation that you experienced already. So that sounds like a, a great uh, great way to coach and bring up your students as they have those rough days. Yeah, because I mean, I experienced it. You know, I experienced the frustration, and I experienced the uh, the effects of overtraining. So again, when I see things like that, I just like to to give my input and let them know, hey, I've been there. I'm not I'm not speaking from, you know, lack of knowledge. I've been there. I've experienced it. You know, so whether it's overtraining, you need to take a break, or you just drill techniques or take a couple of days off, or the frustration of just having a couple bad rowing sessions. You know, you just got to stick with it. You know, don't get frustrated. As long as you're having fun, you're getting to work on your learning, that's what's important. Yep, I, I, I agree on that uh, entirely. Um, we talked a lot about students, and you mentioned that you really like to see students go from uh, like having no balance, and then you know, as time goes, they get to be uh, good you know, at jiu-jitsu. Um, what would you say would be a trait, like a personality trait or something that you, you would recognize in a student early on and think that, that they're going to stick with it and do well? Um, well, I think a lot of it is a mindset. You know, a lot of it is a mindset. Um, you know, you'll see who's, who's open to instruction, things like that. You'll see, you know, if someone in the beginning of their training session, if just their mannerisms, if if they're, when the round ends, if just how they react, you know, some people you just see that they're more mentally tough than others as far as the frustrations of, of training jiu-jitsu in the beginning. You know, just things like that. A lot of times wrestlers with, um, with their background, wrestling is such a hard sport. So if you have someone that came in your gym who has a wrestling background or wrestles competitively, they know what it's like. They, they, they know, you know, how hard, this, you know, the, this sport can be on the body. So, I mean, a lot of times you get tough wrestlers that come in and, you know, they'll pick it up quick. And, again, wrestling is such a hard sport that to translate to jiu-jitsu, you know, they, they have a step ahead of someone who just walked through the door without any wrestling experience. Yeah. Yeah, that it uh, it definitely will uh, harden their mind and body and, and make them, uh, give them that mental toughness that you're going you're gonna to need for wrestling and jiu-jitsu. Definitely. Sticking with the theme of helping out uh, the newer students, what would be a good goal for a student during their first year of training? Um, first year of training. I mean, everyone everyone um, progresses at a different pace. So obviously, you know, if you when you're new, I would imagine your first goal is getting your blue belt. Um, but I think what's important is just to to, to think about improving. You know, I mean, don't get caught up in, 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 in the belts, you know, just, I tell everyone in the beginning, listen, just worry about improving, have fun, get a workout and, you know, everything will come together. You know, I think if they put too much pressure on themselves in the time frame of, of getting promoted or, or something like that, it, it can be, it can be sometimes detrimental. So I, I think for newer people, it's just, you know, coming in, be open-minded, be willing to learn, and, um, you know, have a good time. Like we spoke about earlier, I mean, there's so much knowledge out there. So if someone comes in brand new and they really want to learn, I mean, they can get better pretty fast. You know, they can improve pretty fast. So, I mean, obviously being a blue belt in a year is very, very feasible. I mean, I would say sometimes people can get blue belt in nine months or seven months, depending how often they train. So, it can be a goal, but again, I wouldn't get stuck on just the promotion aspect of it, of, of getting a blue belt. I think the important thing is just to worry about improving, you know? Yeah, that, that's good advice. And it, and you, and you could have that goal to, for the blue belt, but that seems like the people who are 
are most frustrated. If you've been training for a year and a half and somebody's been training for a year and they get their blue belt before you do, that seems like it's a huge, uh, like a demotivating factor for the person who's been there a little bit longer. Yeah, no, it, it can be. You know, it can be. And, you know, again, people people progress at different rates. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, sometimes that does happen. You know, and, it, and it'll take the coach or, or the, the instructor to take that person to the side if they're getting frustrated because people are getting promoted before them. And just let them know, hey, you're doing a good job, you know. You know, maybe, maybe that person who got promoted before you, maybe, maybe they're training um, three, four times a week. You know, and you're coming twice a week. And, hey, you know, you're, you're improving. You just, you know, they, they're coming a little bit more. And that's why they were just improving a little faster. It's, it's nothing to discredit yourself. You're still doing a good job. Sometimes you need to give them that little pep talk and, and let them know as an instructor, you see them on the mat and they, they are getting better. Uh, it sounds like quality coaching that you do uh, for the student who is a little discouraged. Joe, what would be a good way for somebody to kind of keep up with you and what you're doing or, or maybe uh, find you online? Um, I do have a, a website. Uh, a couple of my students run uh, a Facebook page and an Instagram page, and they, they post some stuff here and there. I'm kind of out of the loop with social media, um, so I have uh, people help me with that. I'm kind of like behind in the times. But you, would you get a website that they could go to that you're that that you're involved with, and, and it sounds like your students are running the running the rest of it for you to help you out. Yeah, yeah. My website is um, uh, drcbjj.com. So d a r c e b j j dot com. I believe the Instagram is the same, and um, on my website there's a a link to the Facebook as well. Oh, cool. I'll put links to those on the show notes for everybody to go uh, check out. And if they uh, want to come train with you, the website can get the job done. They can find you through there. Definitely. Yeah. If anyone's in town and they want to stop in, everyone's more than welcome to. Yeah. You get to, uh, he'll try to darse you. He can, he's, he, like you said, he's not promising he'll get the job done every time. I can't, I can't <laughs> guarantee it. You know, there's so many, there's people out there so good at the move and who, who made the move even more popular. You know, people like Jeff Glover, um, you know, there's so many people out there executing the move in all different positions and situations. So I'm even a student of the game. Sometimes I'll pop in some of their moves on, uh, that they post online, and I'll, I'll learn a couple things. So That's cool. Always learning. And like you said that before, that you're always that's that's, always that's, learning, always a student. That's the mentality you have to have. You know, you got to be humble. you got to always be a student of the art, always learning. And I think I do have, uh, on my website, I do have one setup that I posted of the dark show that I do on there. So, you know, feel free to check it out. That's excellent. Well, thank you for that. Um, I appreciate the interview. It's been a pleasure talking with you and, and learning from you and learning a little bit about you. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate Joe DRC giving us this interview. Uh, great to get to know him and know the man behind the choke. And so every time you hear that choke, you could uh, you know think about who he is. And, and if you happen to go into his gym and train, He's going to, he's going to try to dark stroke you. And uh, you know what, to be honest for me, I bet he gets it. <laughs> so, uh, that's cool. And what an honor that would be too, to yeah. be dark choked by, by Joe. Yeah. Why? Well, I mean, that's the, that's the the best person to get that, to get caught in that choke by. So. I'm actually going to start, start calling it now the DRC choke. <laughs> just to confuse I think everybody. I'm gonna, yeah. Just, uh, I mean, that's what I think I'm going to call it for now on. But, uh, you know, my favorite part was just the tips. Um, I, I've always, I've always done okay with a move, but I, I've been wanting to get better at it. I wanted a more clean, uh, DRC choke. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the tips I think will, will definitely help me out. Well, that's good. And I, yeah, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to get tips from him. You know, he's the man behind that choke. So a uh, great opportunity there to, to have him on there. If, uh, you want to keep up with us, the opportunity is probably on Facebook, Twitter, uh, our YouTube channel, and uh, wherever else you might find us on social media. Those are the main ones. So, yep. uh, And speaking of social media, uh, you'll definitely look good in a BJJ brick gi patch on your Fuji Sakai gi when you uh, post a selfie on uh, Facebook. So uh, if you want to get a BJJ brick gi, give us a review. Go on to iTunes and uh, give us a review. Try to make it funny. We'll read it on air. And uh, send us an email, bjjbrick at gmail.com, or send us a message on Facebook. Let us know that was you, because otherwise we have no clue who sent it. Let us know it was you, and if you live in the United States, we'll send you out a BJJ gi patch for free. 
Yep. Boom. It's that easy. One review. Boom. You could do it while you're, uh, you know, you're sitting idle and waiting in line for something or, or don't do it while you're driving. But hey, when you got an extra five minutes, uh, write the review and you get yourself a geek patch in the mail. Write the review, then write an email to us. So, Yeah. Very important. Hey, also, uh, we got uh, Claudio this week. As you know, Claudio has been teaching us Portuguese. And uh, this week, he's going to teach us to say four different words in Portuguese. Uh, yes, no, good, and bad. The nice thing is, now you'll be able to describe my jiu-jitsu. He's going to teach you how to say bad. So you'll be all set. There we go. All right. Here's our friend Claudio. Oi, Claudio. Oi, Brian. Tudo bem? Tudo bem. All right. How's everything going with you? Are you practicing your, your por favor and obrigado? Uh, a, a little bit, you know. It's it's uh, it's starting to sink in a little bit better as I uh, say it. I think that's the important thing if you're listening, um, mm-hmm. you know, and you're not in a place that would be super embarrassing to say things out loud. Right. Go ahead and do that. You know, that's how we. Uh, you, you get that. You're you're already missing the visual aspect of of learning, but you get to hear it and then you get to to say it. So there's there's two different pathways for you to try to learn things, and you're learning things so you can say it. So um, that that's true. And, and that's something too. If if you're listening to it and here in Wichita, you can always come to me and ask questions, or you know, ask Byron right now. He's a perfect. Yeah, teacher. but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, don't 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 feel afraid to ask questions or you know, just say what you know, <clears throat> and we'll go from there. There you it's go. It. Learning Always process. learning. I'm learning English every day. I learn a new word every day. So. So do I, Claudio. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. What are we going to do today? We're going to talk about, we, we talked, uh, seen, or no, right? Yes, or Yes bad, and no would be no. would be valuable, and I think uh, maybe good and bad would be, right. would be okay. nice. All right, so the, the first one will be the yes. Yes is seen, S-I-M, seen. Seem. Uh huh. You won't. You, you don't sound the M very much. You know, like a sim, like a sim card. Okay. You, you don't. You don't sound the M. It, it's it's almost like an N, but it, you you don't really sound. It just dies. You know. You says S I in the M is almost. Uh, sim. How do you say that? Uh, fades away. F- fades away. Exactly. Thank you. So sim. Sim. It, it, you, exactly. Good job, good job. And the the no will be no. That's a tricky one. It's a, a very nasal, so you, you almost have to say it through your nose, no. basically. No. 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 <laughs> you put you put your tongue. Uh, here's here's uh, here's a little tip. Good. I need a tip. On top of your mouth, like that. And, uh, Top no of the mouth, uh, the, the mouth, uh, the what do you call the inside, inside the, roof the roof of your mouth, the roof of the mouth. Thank you. You learn a new language, <laughs> new word in English today, uh, and you pronounce it no. So you start with the tongue on top of your no. mouth there and says no. And no. The sound almost comes out of your nose. So go ahead, give it a try. No. 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 <laughs> hey, it's getting. It's getting. Uh, I, I feel like it's a tricky one. Yeah. Um, yep. I'm not. Uh, that's one of the, one of those words that uh, it's going to take a little practice for me. No. 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 <laughs> okay. It sounds like you're saying no, but a little bit differently. No. no. I mean, if you say no, uh, I, I know you. Saying, you know, if you're if I don't speak any English and you say no, it's basically the same thing. It's no, you know, just a little, yeah. little bit different, but it's understandable. <laughs> you can tell where you're saying no, you know, shake your hands, wave your hands, and uh, no, I don't want to do this, you know, no, so, I don't want to get, you know, choked uh, out or something. <laughs> Claudio, for mm-hmm. uh, does a head nod yes or no? Is that the same? Absolutely the same. Yes. So, not my head up and down is yes, and then side to side is no. No, side to side is 
I decided no, yes, that's that's exactly right. So on that, you know, sense you can communicate to body language is very important too. So that's that's a good way to think. You know, you can say no, shaking your hand, you know, your head left to to right or something like that. And okay, they would know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, well that'll get the message across. And then how about uh, good and bad? Good and bad. Okay, good is boom. 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 B O M. If you're if you're writing it down. And uh, bad is it depends. It, it can be ruin. It's R U I M. So boom is good and bad is ruin or mal. Mao is another word. It, it depends on the context. It, it depends where you're trying to communicate. So if you're saying, oh, this, this food is bad, for example, you're going to say, uh, essa comida é ruim. Ruim. So you say, ruim. Yeah, it's, it's, it's bad. Now, um, if you're feeling bad, now you say, estou me sentindo mal. So it, it depends what you are trying to communicate. Okay. So it could be the bad could be two two different two different words. Huin, mao, and there's a few different ones too that we can use, but those are the most used ones I guess. And and good is it could be well, uh it could be pain as well, it could be good or just bone. So it could be bang or bang is more like a well. I'm doing well. Estou bang. Like tudo bang. Remember that the first tudo week? Bang. So that bang is well. It's close to the the uh good. Okay. It can be used in the in the same the same terms too. Also depends how you're using it. So good bom, bom. and bad Huim or Mao. Huim or Mao. Mm -hmm. um, so Mao is almost like Mao, you know, M A L L. Okay. You pronounce the A a little bit more instead of O, you know, like a A Mao. Mao. Yeah, like mouth. There you go. Like mouth or mouse. Um, mouth as my mouth. Mouth. Okay, like Mao. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So if I ate something with my mouth, I will be feeling mal. If I ate something bad. <laughs> That's right. Right. Okay. <laughs> You're um, feeling bad. You're feeling mal. <laughs> okay. And the other, the other bad is describe something um, other than yourself, maybe. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's those are the the ideas. So, um, boom. I think I've heard this before. Uh, it seems like um, some people that are teaching jujitsu will uh, show you a technique, you know, like grab right here, boom, and they'll say that. And it's just, to me, I've heard the word B-O-O-M, and then they're just like adding action to, to, their, to their description. You know, grab this right here, boom, and then over here, boom. But really they're saying, this is good. Is that true, or am I making that up? Well, it... it it depends, I think, on the uh, what you're using for. Like on that sense, it, uh, it's hard to tell. It could be they're just saying "boom" as "bam." Yeah, oh, yeah. Just a just a, an it. action word. Or, yeah. Okay. Exactly. It's not necessarily just telling you good. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> well, that, that, uh, these these are good to know, and I have to I'll have to work with saying no. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be nodding my head, that's for sure. Um, no, no, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but that, that's good to know, that, that, that nodding your head. Uh, sometimes things flip in reverse, or sometimes it means something totally different. So you always have to be careful of, of body language and hand gestures uh, when you're going to somewhere sure. uh, that's, that's foreign true. to you. If you were asking for a new, uh, more drinks or another caipirinha or something like that, you just ask, see, see, just wave it. Wave more here. Yeah. <laughs> well, these <And> are good. <laughs> All right. Well, it's 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 been uh, four valuable words that, uh, and I've learned three of them, and uh, 
<laughs> struggling with the word no, that's for sure. But uh, I'll work with those, and uh, we'll, we'll have you back on again next week for some more key uh, words. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Claudio. All right. Another thank you to Claudio. Um, it, like I, Just like before, all these lessons are thrown into one uh, file, and I put it up on YouTube. Uh, so if you're actually going to go to Brazil and you want to learn them all, uh, check that out, and it should be a little easier to learn them back-to-back versus you know throughout each episode once a week, which might be good for you as well. I mean, to pick up a couple of words at a time th- over the course of several weeks is probably a good way to do it. But if you want yep. a little more intensive study, go, go to our YouTube channel for that or go to the show yep. notes. Yep. Hey, and we're going to switch things up a little bit here this week as uh, Byron is working on a new audio book this week instead of myself. <laughs> I decided to take a week off. But uh, Okay. Okay. I'm ready. Yeah. Byron's got a great audio book this week, and it's uh, uh, basically the name of it is Why I Wear My Gi When I Cut My Yard and Do Yard Work Around the House. Uh, it's a very informative one, and uh, and I'll go right to Byron and let him talk about it. Yeah. So I've got that new Fuji Sakai Gi. Um, I, I I haven't yet mowed the lawn in that because it will, I'm worried that it'll turn kind of green from like the knees down. But the you know of course the the title of the book is called Why Do I Wear My Key When I Cut the Lawn, and that's a very good question. Um, basically, it's advertising for jujitsu. I put a sign up next to next to the yard there saying you know jujitsu, uh, talk to me and I'll be happy to show you where the gym is because it's not here. <laughs> But uh, and, and also, I'm thinking about opening up a lawn business. If you know, if this podcast doesn't ever take off, I need to make some income uh, with some yard set mowing, and I could be uh, the guy in the gi mowing lawns. And, and of course, you know, anytime you get people talking about any type of business, is generally good. So uh, I'll just be the gi guy, and uh, my business card is going to have you know me with a gi and a lawn mower, and I'll be kind of mowing lawns. And I don't do that good a job mowing the lawn, but uh, I am wearing a gi, Harry. But I, I know you were talking about to make your jiu-jitsu better and to, uh, to attract more people to, to talk to you about jiu-jitsu. You were telling me a lot of times you don't necessarily just walk and push the mower. You shrimp across the yard and push the mower and you duck walk. Can yeah. you explain about these, that these, these are very advanced techniques because that mower is a implement of destruction, basically. I mean, shrimping while you push the mower... Uh, it is very dangerous, and I don't recommend it unless you finish reading the entire book. Then is, you're good to go. But uh, the shrimp in the duck walk, yeah. If you get shrimp with a lawnmower, you get shrimp with anybody, uh, you know, trying to hold you down, and you could make that space you need. Yeah, so th- those are big things. One of the weird things that people don't think about is that I am barefoot while I'm doing this. Uh, so I do have, uh, I do not have a green thumb. Well, my toes are green. <laughs> so uh, I got that going for me, Gary. Yes, and I know you said you had anybody who buys it now gets the extra chapter, but it's only a page long. But it's how to barambola while cutting the yard. There we go. Yes, that's uh, so you get that free, free yeah. extra page. It's and the, and the first time you do it is scary. That lawnmower flips right over, the blades come up, and you're underneath it. But uh, you got to have the right kind of uh, handle. You know, you don't want the thing like popping away from you too much. But uh, you know. You should see the way I started, Gary. Just use your imagination. Um, it's all jujitsu. It's all technique. Yep. Hey, uh, actually, right now, um, I just got an email from one of our from one of our listeners. <laughs> sure, you did, Gary. <laughs> Go ahead. It's, I, I'm telling you, we may have to start putting Byron in this part of the thing. And, and this is the email I just got. I just listened to Byron's uh, talk about. Uh, uh, cutting his yard in his Fuji Sakagi, and it has really made me want to start training Jiu Jitsu. So I'm going to go find where he lives and talk to him. Thank you so much. I think Byron is the best at doing this. Sincerely, Byron's mom. There we go. Yeah, she's so nice. But the I like where this is going because um, I'm thinking of like a Daniel Sun type of relationship with these people who come and want to learn Jiu Jitsu from me. Uh, I have them mow the lawn for like three months. And then, and then teach them what that's done for them, which is basically nothing. But they got some general cardio walking around the yard for about 45 minutes. Uh, so that's what I got going on. It's, it's really, we talk a lot about shrimping and duck walking and barambolo, but uh, it's really just a way to get my yard mode for free, much like uh, Mr. Miyagi's fence painted and car waxed. 
that is actually a smart idea. Oh. So uh, definitely check out Byron's uh, ebook. Uh, should be coming to stores very soon. Yep, in the lawn and gardening section. So that was, Gary. <laughs> I don't have a green top, but I got green toes. <laughs> I had to stop. I was about to die laughing. Well, that's good. That was hilarious. Well, Gary, this has been uh, a lot of fun, and I hope the listeners have uh, had fun as well. If you've had a good time and you learned a little bit today, uh, we really appreciate it if you would tell a friend about us. We appreciate all the social media stuff and any, any sharing you do or any of that stuff, but odds are you train at a gym. You've got people around you that train. Uh, mention it to them and, and let them know uh, where, you're, where you're hanging out with us. So uh, that's a great way to spread the word, and we greatly appreciate uh, the word of mouth spread that we've had lately. Yep, and also tell all your friends, do not mix, miss next week's show. Uh, we have Tim Cartmel, BJJ Black Belt on the show. Another awesome show. The guy is just incredible. Do not miss it. There we go. It's going to be uh, a lot of fun. If you ever need to get a hold of us, uh, BJJBrick at gmail.com is a great way to do it. Uh, but uh, other than that, Facebook, Instant Messenger. Uh, on our uh, Facebook channels, Facebook channel, Facebook fan page is, uh, is another good way. So uh, I'm still looking for questions for the BJJ Brick Q and A uh, YouTube channel I've started. So uh, if you have just general questions about jujitsu or uh, have anything for me to answer on that show, send it to the email address, and uh, we'll be happy to kind of get that up there for you, I guess. <laughs> so definitely get us your questions, and uh, we'll get you some answers. So. Uh, Gary, till next week, my friend. I want you to stay sweaty. And don't forget to shower. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> <laughs>